Okay, thank you so much for coming. Uh, for everyone who is watching, thank you all for watching. Uh, uh, today we are going to talk about something. I don't know if you've ever wondered why some missionaries stay longer on the field or stay for a short time. And I have a guest today, Jeff Whiteman, who's going to be able to uh, lead us in this conversation. And we trust that God is going to speak through him to each one of us as you listen. So don't go halfway because this is amazing and incredible. Uh, so, Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you want to just introduce yourself? Yeah, Velma, thank you so much for the invitation. So I, um, I'm really grateful that we connected. We have a, a mutual uh, a friend that we admire a lot and uh, who, who connected us. And I, I love that's the way the world of mission works. Mm -hmm. you yes. Know? <laughs> you know, and it's like there's like, you know, there's like the Holy Spirit's the conductor. And we're and we're just doing our doing our part in the orchestra. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think that I mean that's probably a good. Yeah, if I were to say anything about myself, it would be that. You know, mm. uh, I want to be a person who uh, you know who plays my part in the orchestra that the whole yeah. orchestra is conducting. So, um, I am uh, I'm a, a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Kentucky, and I've been in um, working in uh, member care. Uh, that's kind of the broad term we use for the care of missionaries or global workers yeah. um, for ah, a long time, probably, I don't know, 15 years or so. Um, and uh, um, and part of that has been also my own work in uh, trying to understand how, how are some people able to persevere with joy? Mm. That's kind of what led me to study resilience. Um, so... That feels like enough on me. So I'm, I, could, I could say more, but that, that feels sufficient. So yeah. thank you so much. Welcome. So did you start I'm um, start this work while you're still a student at Asbury? Yeah, yeah. So I you know, I um I so I how do I go back to that? Um so I started working in vocational ministry in like the year two thousand. So Oh, okay. a long, long time ago. And mm -hmm. I really knew at that point that I was like called into ministry, uh, but I had no idea if I could make it, you know, <laughs> which I think a lot of us have had those experiences. Yes. And I watched the people around me kind of um, leave. Mm -hmm. And whenever they left, it was kind of a, it was a real like shock to my sense of like, I thought they were going to make it and they didn't make it. Yeah. Can I make it? Uh, I looked ahead to some of the people who were ahead of me and they, they didn't, they seemed to be pretty, now I would say they were traumatized, but at the time they just looked jaded and burned out and, yeah. and they didn't have that abundant life that Jesus had promised that he'd come to bring. And they, I didn't see it, you know? And so yeah. I just, you know, I was wondering, wondering, so that's what led me to be curious about this. And mm -hmm. then I worked for our mission organization with my wife and, uh, do you ever feel like sometimes God slams the door open and you stumble backwards through it? Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that kind of happened, you know, and uh, it's happened a lot, but it happened and we ended up at uh, Asbury in 2010 wow. and I uh, studied marriage and family therapy. Actually, I came at marriage and family therapy with an interest in mission missionary relationships because I oh. knew the missionary relationships were at the center of why people were coming and going and the struggles and support yeah. they were having. So I wanted to understand relationships better. And so that's actually what led me into marriage and family therapy. So, okay. and in that I ended up discovering, I, I can really love working with couples. So that's good. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you, um, uh, uh, with several others wrote this book. I don't know if our audience, I hope you can see it. Yeah. it is, I'm going to put the link in the description guys for you. You have to get this copy. Like, Oh my, I feel like there's some parts I'm reading. I'm like, okay, God, this is my life. And some of them tears are coming. And some of them I'm like, I wish I knew. Uh, so you have to get this book. But tell us what led to you do. A re your research is focused on missionary resilience. Yeah. What led you to that? Yes. Uh, um, so it was a deep inner need that I had to understand like how do people, how do people in ministry persevere with joy? Mm. And when I looked at, and you know, if you ever kind of look at research in member care, you you discover like, wow, there's not a ton of research here. Um, 
and then you realize that like so that's one thing you realize another thing you realize is that like a lot of um like some of the ways we think about like especially like resilience especially as westerners is um is not really aligned with what mm -hmm. what we what we know experientially and what we know theologically from the lives of people, and so the kind of Western vision of resilience is more like kind of like being independent and tough and rugged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an American, it's so much a part of our national narrative. You know, from like the Pilgrims to the pioneers. You know, yeah. Uh, to like you know, it's just this rugged kind of you know, and it's like but when you. When you listen to when you especially read Paul's letters and you you get to know people who who really have persevered with joy, you see in them like a humility and a meekness, mm. not a ruggedness, you know, not a toughness. There's there's not it's different, you know. And so I knew there was kind of, you know, I knew there was more to it. And so I mm -hmm. wanted to go and listen directly to the stories of missionaries and understand from them what, you know, what what did they have to say about what what helped them to grow in their resilience? What supported that journey for them? Uh, what did that really mean? And so I launched that study on my birthday seven years ago. Um, and yeah. And uh, I was hoping that maybe a hundred people would participate and um, I could talk to 10 of them and write a lovely article. <laughs> I had almost a thousand people respond to that. Um, I had to pivot to a written interview and that generated like about 650 pages. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah so my, my wife just finished her dis defended her dissertation on it i have a I have a copy of it here so <laughs> oh my <laughs> in last may and she looked uh -huh. just at the at the written interviews um and so um and so yeah i think we you know i think we we have some things uh by god's grace that we can say about what how how missionaries become resilient what it means for them mm -hmm. uh, and how we can support that process yeah uh, there's something right an introduction of the book, uh, and maybe let me just say uh, what, what you talked about, the missionality. Before we started the call, uh, we talked a little about, I talked about my my experience. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I've been a missionary for more than two decades, and, yeah. uh, and it was more for an indigenous missions organization, so it's an African-based Yep. And uh, and I think there are many other African-based um, missions organization. It's a walk by faith. Yes, yeah. you might have family support you. So when you go on the field, it's you're you're saying yes to God, and yes, yeah. you're saying yes to God. But when you're on the field, you're on the field. Yep. <laughs> yep. And so I watched several friends. Well, after some time, I'm like, well, I don't know if I can do it again. Especially, especially maybe those, especially those who had kids, because the dynamics change. When you have a wife and you have children, and yep. maybe you're not get, getting the funds, you watch your kids not having all the meals they should. Yeah, like it's just it just weighs the new ones. Many people like say, "Okay, I'm sorry, I know I'm caught, but I don't know if I can do it." And yep. and so yeah, so thank you all because this has been just incredible. But you say something about uh, I'm going to read it. So the essentials of for people care and development. You, you said sorry. He said, we need exegesis of the text and ethnography of the context if we, if the good news is to be the good news. Can you talk a little about that for people to understand what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let me, I want to just kind of circle back and say one thing that, and, and tie into, actually answer that in a way that ties in what you just said. Uh, I mean, I just, it really warms my heart to hear how this kind of resonates with you and your experience. And that's really, you know, when you when you put together a volume you you want it to you know you have in mind how it's going to be a blessing to people um and uh, it's really so thanks for sharing that it connected with me in your story um we wanted to design it in a way that uh so there's like additional resources and and reflection discussion questions and we wanted to design it in a way that it could be helpful to yeah. people and to groups of people um and just to hear how it connected with you and is really really good so thank you for that. So You're welcome. Um, yeah. So that so in the uh, preface, I you know, I said that, um, and that's a that's a maxim of 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 missiology of missions. You know the, mm -hmm. the good. You know that we have to uh, if it if it's good news, you know it needs to be good news here and now. 
Mm. Yeah, and to understand how it's good news here and now, uh, we need to understand both the context as well as the text. Yeah. And uh, what's you know what is what makes it good news here and now? Um, and so, I think. Uh, Well, this is something that's on my mind, and so I think it connects to what you're saying. Um, and so, like, as a you know, as a uh, yeah, as an American, as a Westerner, like, and as someone who works in member care, uh, I I feel a like um, a deep indebtedness to, mm. to the to the to how Christianity grew in the soil of Africa. Mm. both in the sense of like historic orthodoxy yeah you know and you know who are the church fathers you know that we, mm -hmm. the, the faith was passed down to us from and who we depend on and yeah like, you know the food they ate grew in the soil of africa and the water yeah. they drank flowed from the springs of africa yes you know and it's like we are like christians are indebted like in a general and historic way to Africa. Mm -hmm. But more specifically, you know, in member care, specifically in member care, I think that we also have a real indebtedness. Um, and so um, we can, as a Westerners, we could approach member care as if it were a resource problem. Mm -hmm. You know? as if the solution to the problem is resources. No. Okay. And, um, and I don't think that's actually the truth of the matter. Resources are important, but I don't think they're the whole thing. And so mm -hmm. also was a part of a really small mission organization, you know? And so I, I really under, like, I mean, I really appreciate my own experiences of like living by faith yeah you know, sort of being out there you know and yeah um and as i've talked with i mean i have a couple of friends and from um african friends who are in member care and one of the things that i really value from them is their perspective on the the role of of prayer yes in in member care yeah um, which is one of the things that can we can be neglectful of in the West. Mm -hmm. As our kind of like, we can sort of add that on instead of really like making that the foundation. Um, and in that sense, actually, yeah, I, yeah, I think a lot of our member care issues are relational and narrative in nature. What's the story we're telling ourselves? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's good. Yeah. And so um and so I think there's some places where it's actually we have a lot to receive from um yeah and friendship really as a as a as a friendship um, from those um in the global south today. So yeah. And that's, a lot. Awesome. And so that's that, that's kind of what I mean by like we need to understand both the context and the, the text. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How yeah, that's a good one. Yes. How is this good news here and now. Mm -hmm. and wow, that's good. Yeah. Okay. I think I didn't get it before. I think now I'm like, okay, yes. Now it connects. <laughs> okay. I'm kind of yes. meandering a little bit, and I wanted to sort of that's a, um yeah that other thing was something that's important to me to say. Of uh, I'm trying to connect it to me with that, but it's like how do we you know what's happening in this person's life? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, what's what's happening in this community's life? Yeah. yeah. And not just and what and how does that connect in with the the good news mm -hmm. of what god is doing in the world oh, god, and yeah. how we are invited to be a part of it so. mm -hmm. wow awesome thank you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah so uh i think there's a part of the, the 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 book i think it's just it might it should be chapter one i think so you talk about the different lenses of suffering yeah and uh yeah, uh, Tim and Kimberly commit, uh, contributed that chapter, and it's a great, it's a really good, um, helpful framework of mm -hmm. appreciating that uh, we have different, well, different lenses that we look mm -hmm. through our 
um, through our stories through and especially through our suffering with um, and that uh, those they can those lenses can be really helpful and harmful. Yeah. You know, we need to uh, uh, evaluate the story that we're telling ourselves yeah. and what's what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so so how how can the missionary uh, be able to uh, let's say when they go through a circumstance? Yeah, I'm going to give an example. In when I was in, uh, I went for a leadership thing in Cote d'Ivoire, and we were attacked by armed robbers, and uh, I lost my computer, everything, and so how do I handle that uh, as a missionary in a way that is healthy, and I'm, I don't feel like okay, maybe God abandoned me, or maybe how do I use how do like, how do I use the right lens? How do I discern which lens is appropriate to use? Or even for the missions organization to know how to discern correctly so that they help the missionaries uh, thrive and live in, experience wholeness and fulfillment and joy as they serve the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a, um, it's a hard question to answer uh, mm -hmm. because and I'll tell you why, because uh, I have to answer it in a general way, uh, mm. but each of us is thinking about it in a very personal way. Personal way, yeah. You know, you're you're thinking, you know, about the the time when you were robbed. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, and so uh, I have to kind of answer that in a very open-handed, general way. Mm -hmm. um, recognize like people are going to internalize that in a very personal way to their story. And so, um, so I think the you know one thing that I find helpful here is to, uh, first of all, is just time um, mm -hmm. and process, you know? And so like, I, you know, like I had some stuff happen in my life uh, not that long ago that was really unexpected and mm -hmm. you know, uh, really kind of shook the foundations for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did was I just gave myself some time, you know? Mm -hmm. And part of it is that, like, I mean, the truth is, is that you do feel like God has forsaken you and abandoned you. Yeah. And that is the truth, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's not like, and you're like, wow, Lord, I think you've forsaken me. I think you've abandoned me. Um, and that was where I, like, um, lament is really important for us and being able to, you know, like, bring that to the Lord. Yeah. Um, it's also important for us to have a like curiosity about what the lenses are that that we have. You know, how mm -hmm. is God making sense of this? And just be having a I, I think that chapter is really helpful in laying out about six different lenses. Yeah. Questions to kind of work through that mm -hmm. uh, to help to understand that. Um, but I had a uh, I was talking with a, a couple very recently and they were, you know. They had felt like they were experiencing like a you know, like spiritual attack, um, and so we took some time to kind of unpack that, uh, what was going on, what was happening, yeah, and, um, in a way that I think helped them to like see like oh you know maybe there's some other factors at play here and um, mm -hmm. including our own you know and it actually opened up the door for something bigger and more beautiful to mm -hmm. something more true to emerge, um, yeah, and so. Um, when people, you're gonna have to hang out for a second. My my dog's here, so she's. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what she has to say. Um, <laughs> and when we approach other people, uh, it's important for us to to approach them with a kind of open handedness. And mm. um, yeah. sometimes it's it, sometimes in being well-meaning we can actually be pretty pretty hurtful to people and trying to kind of like tell them what this means and what the you know what the purpose is and yeah. um and so being you know so like with that couple with that couple it was a like let's be curious about this you know oh yeah i'm not telling you what it is or is i don't know how could i know mm -hmm. um yeah. so uh but what's the story we're telling ourselves and um that's a really important one. Oh, That's awesome. a really important one. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You said, I'm going to, uh, I, I didn't think about this, but you talked about lament as you're yeah. talking. Talk a little about that because there are times uh, 
uh, when when somebody here laments, they feel like it's you lament because you don't have faith. Maybe the context I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah. And so talk about lament and how why that is important and how that is healthy for our faith and our ability to be able to keep going. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to kind of put my counsel hat on for a second. Um, yes. So we there's a fancy term called meta emotion. It's how we feel about our feelings. Hmm. And most of us grew up in homes where, um, you know, like certain emotions were okay and other emotions were not okay. And some emotions were expressed in ways that were destructive and others were repressed in ways that were destructive. And uh, especially as Christians, we then spiritualize our emotions. And, you know, if I'm angry, it's because I'm prideful. If I'm anxious, it's because I lack faith. Uh. We judge our selves for having our emotions and what happens then is that we our, our relationship with if our relationship with god is that sort of if the aim is that kind of intimacy that we see in the garden mm. or, or like naked and unashamed um and they're not trying to cover themselves up with fig leaves that don't work yeah. uh, in our relationship with god what happens is we feel like those negative there are emotions that we can't express to God. Hmm. And so we turn away from God, just like Adam and Eve do. Yeah. And we hide. Wow. Uh, and so lament is about kind of turning to God with our disappointment, with our anger, mm -hmm. with all of that stuff that we, you know, um, we uh, we want to sort of bottle up and keep inside. And we turn to God, um, knowing who God is, God's faithfulness to us, God's mm -hmm. love. And we, you know, we turn to God with this anger, with this frustration, with this lament. Um, you know, a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Yeah. And yet, you know, many, many Christians struggle to turn to God with their anger, with their disappointment. Mm. They want to bring their offering to the Lord of like, you know, the, the good things, you know, like, you know, they want to bring their tithe and they want to bring their faith and they want to bring, their yeah. faith. they want to offer all of this to the Lord. And you can also, in a weird way, you can also offer to the Lord your anger and your disappointment, <laughs> frustration. You're like, Lord, I'm just really pissed about this situation. I'm really <laughs> ticked about this. I'm going to offer it to you and you're going to have to do something with it because I don't know. Mm. And so wow. I'm that kind of turning to God with, with those, with those, with all that, all that emotion that we would normally not turn to God with. Mm -hmm. And uh, he can, he, I mean, you know, most of us have experience of like, it's like uh, if you turn to a friend or like a, a trusted advisor with all of that stuff, you, yeah. and they and they're able to be empathic to you compassionate to you mm -hmm. you feel a relief yes because you're not like carrying it alone mm -hmm. yeah, and uh imagine turning to god with all of that yeah and receiving his compassion mm -hmm. benevolent gaze that's his beautiful love. yeah that's awesome yeah Thank you. Wow, that's that's beautiful. Guys, I hope this is impacting you. Please let's us invite someone to watch this and uh, share it with someone. Oh, uh, so uh, from I think from most of the book, one of the things I see is our relationship with God is key to last longer on the mission field. Yep. You do you want to talk about um, how why is that central? So and I would, yes, and I would, I want to kind of do a yes and to that, which is to say that like one of the things we found in our research was that it, a uh, relationship with God is, this is actually kind of a bold statement. It's, um, but I think it's true. And I think it's also true theologically. Uh, the relationship with God is essential, but not sufficient. Mm. Um, and I mean, I guess we can go back to the garden and say that like, you know, in the garden, like, how is it possible that Adam is alone? Yes. You know? Yeah. 
Right. And so that relation, you know, and even in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is with his father and still is still needs his friends to be there. And so mm-hmm. the relationship with God is absolutely essential yeah. for our longevity in ministry, um, for fruitfulness. And it's not sufficient. Uh, we also need our relationship with others. And we need our and interestingly, we need our relationship with ourselves. That's a really interesting one to think about. Like, oh, that because I watch your Vimeo, you talk about the three-legged. Yeah, so actually, I I like keep a three-legged stool <laughs> uh, as a way of like you know like with one leg is not stable. Yes, not stable. But yeah, is a stable. Yeah, a stable. Oh, yeah, wow. Cool. And that relation. And so we need that turning toward God, turning toward others, and mm-hmm. toward ourselves with loving support in order to. To be able to be um to be able to face the uh the kinds of things that we face in ministry and in cross-cultural ministry yeah and well and truthfully for all of us today just in life right so yeah, yeah. um and so um so your question is why why is that important yes mm-hmm. yeah that's a good question um I let me. I'm gonna uh, try an answer on, and you you tell me if it resonates with you and your your. Okay. Um, and that is because that the why is because that is really what is true. Mm. Our you know our our ministry is a ministry with God. Yeah. Joining God's mission in the world. Mm-hmm. And so. Uh, and we all drift into doing our ministry for God. Yes, I agree. Yes, and we all drift into like you know, uh, wanting to wanting to be accepted instead mm. of working out of being accepted. Wow! Wow! We drift to wanting to be accepted instead of working out of being accepted. Yeah. Yes. We do the like if you know if I do this work, then you will. Yes. Yeah. It's so like, I'm already accepted. So I'm not whatever whatever I do doesn't change my acceptance. So now I'm working from a place of rest, actually. Yeah, we work out of our rest. We don't rest from our yes. work. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. that's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. So that relationship with God is central because that's like, you know, you have to have these times where it's like, you know. Um, where things don't go the way you imagine, where you do experience like heartache and um, disappointment and you come back to that, you know, like the parable of the talents where it's like they begin with nothing in their hands and they end with nothing in their hands. Mm-hmm. One of yeah. them has nothing in his hands because he, he returns the 10 talents mm-hmm. and the other has nothing in his hands because he buried the talents. But they, mm. they both have nothing in their hands. Yeah. E- even what they earn, they return. Um, and so there's a sense in which, like, it's true. It's true that this is this is Jesus's mission in the world that we yes. are a part of. And uh, we are his beloved. Yeah. And we're participating in his work. Yeah. We'll bring one day reigning shalom. You know, all yeah. will be well one day. So. Yeah. And I think that's so liberating for missionaries, though, because when you when you are when you serve with that mindset, there is no um, uh, like a sense of how do I put it? Like have to. You still serve the Lord with all diligence, with all commitment, because you love Him. But you serve from that place of I don't make the results happen. I, I'm just in this partnership. I get I'm, I get I'm honored to be in this partnership with Him. And I think that's just beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep. And it's it's also like, uh, I think for us who work in ministry, it's also, a, um, it creates a, a, a point of like, um, it's like a, like a, a speed bump or a guardrail we have to just be really mindful of because it's easy to like professionalize our faith. You know? mm. Get the two, yes. you know, get the two mixed up. And yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, it's easy to, it's easy to, so, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. So how can missions organization create systems that will help missionary resilience? So 
That is a really good question. And there's, I mean, it's a hard, it's hard to give, I mean, there's a lot to unpack with that. But I think the probably the first thing I would say there is uh, it's kind of, it's another perspective question. So we just, you know, in America, we just watched the Super Bowl yesterday. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, it's really important to understand, like, who are the players mm. on the field, right? And so uh, member care as a discipline grew out of the, actually there was a, there was a huge, um, in the 1970s, uh, all the mainline denominations were shutting down their mission programs. Um, and uh -huh. they, they were saying, bas they basically they were saying like, hey, every country has a church, mission accomplished, job done. You know? Oh, and okay. Ralph Winter gave a presentation at uh, Lausanne in 1974. So it was 50 years ago this mm -hmm. year. And he said, hey, the Great Commission is about people groups. It's not about nations. And the job yes. is undone. And he galvanized, you know, um, us uh, to like reimagine the Great Commission uh, for mm -hmm. our, our time and place as something yeah. we needed to devote ourselves to. Mm -hmm. um, and so similarly, member care emerged around the same time when there was this huge amount of attrition. People were leaving mission organizations. Um, yeah. And part of it connected to the like advancement in technology and uh mobility and some of these things uh and so we made uh this was a very helpful place to start but it became kind of a harmful place um to, mm. and that was we said uh, our goal is to eliminate preventable attrition mm. yeah. good place to start became a harmful status quo here's why um it gets the the game confused and it puts, oh. right? and so we, as um, you know, member care, as organizations, we're like the coaches on the side. Yes, we're not the players, mm -hmm. right? And uh, the people, the players, um, and the ball, and that, like what's happening there is, you know, that's that kind of turning, like it's them turning toward God, turning towards the people around them, turning towards themselves. It's a much smaller, like yeah. Right? And we made the game, we like shortened the game so that, uh, yeah, so that um, it became about their tenure with our organization. Mm -hmm. so we kind of, we, we tried to be in the center and um, we made the game too short and we made it as though like the only, we had to play until we lost. Because like if the goal is mm -hmm. attrition, you just, you can't win, you just play until you lose. Yes, right. yes, yeah. Okay, uh, so that's a long metaphor of saying that like, you know, organ like the, the first thing we have to do as organizations, within our organizations, um, is to like understand like what's our role, what's our place, what's the story? You know, so like we're, we're, we're on the side. We're, you know, we're on the sidelines and we need to, we need to honor that. And there are things we can and can't do. Um, so when we listen, we, we asked organizations um, actually how they could support, like, sorry, we asked that data set what people had to say about their organizations. And oh, okay. okay, does that make sense? So we yes. weren't, the data wasn't actually asking about organizations, but people had a lot to say about people. organizations. Okay. And so that, uh, and we published that in uh, this article of EMQ. And I'll give you a link. To okay. For people to get a copy of that. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Awesome. Um, and uh, it the three areas that really stood up were um, training, leading, and care. Mm. Training, leading, and care. That was, and it's, we can unpack like that article unpacks that. Uh, but I like that because it makes a TLC. Yeah, training, leading. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, and that is probably the thing that we need. That we probably in our society at large um, are most in like have vitally low levels of, <laughs> which yeah. is empathy and compassion and grace and goodwill. Yeah. We are, we are like woefully lacking of, of mm. in our, in our society at large. And that plays out in our organizations. Mm. It's easy for organizations to see themselves as um, 
you know, as their workers, as like, you know, either as like, you know, like existing to help them fulfill their mission. Oh, so, or that's a profound one. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Or they can see, or they can see the organization as existing to fulfill the, the mission of their donors or their, you know, whoever, whoever the, whoever the people are, you know, yeah. they work for. Uh, and instead of seeing that interdependence we have. And so um, I would say, you know, it was possible a long time ago for mission organizations to separate the great commandment from the great commission. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's, and I think they do so today at their own peril. Yeah, yeah you can't separate if you are going to be effective and you can't separate. No. It has to be, but yeah. And we have to, we have to have, uh, yeah, we have to work out our, our love for one another. Yeah. And we have to do that in right, you know, in the right posture that we have. Like, what there are things we can and can't do as organizations. Yeah. People's stories un unfold as they unfold, you know, so. Um, yeah, so that's, a, that would be kind of, um, I, I really, that's not a very good concrete answer to your question. Um, so let me give you a, let me summarize that with say, uh, we need to, you know, what's our role in the life of the people who work for us? You know, what yes. can't we do? Um, how can we uh, encourage them in the, in their turning toward God themselves and others for that loving support they need to be resilient? Mm -hmm. How do we, uh, and especially in the arenas of training, leading, and care, the LC, um, and how do we do that in a way that embodies the great commandment of love within our yeah. community? Mm. So that would be a good, those would be good um, questions. Yep. And there probably is some where, some of that where organizations need to be listening to their workers. Listening to, yeah. Finding out from them. And there's probably some stuff where they need to be uh, rejoicing and repenting. Yes. <laughs> the Lord, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think there's one that, uh, I don't know which chapter it is, but it talks about collaboration uh, for missions, the, the yeah. importance of that. And maybe I'm just using my experience and the experience of several other missionaries I know yep. uh, who were serving in different parts of Africa. Those were indigenous. And it's like canceling is just something that is becoming even something now. So missionary care or member care, it's not, it's not even the language that is spoken. Yeah. And so how how can how can organizations in the global south that don't have all this? resources and entities be able to connect and still be able to find what they need to support the missionaries that yeah. are set for them. I think that's a I don't think I could answer that question in terms of I think I would have to ask your you your input on that from <laughs> your perspective. I can share a, what I think I can share a couple of thoughts. One is that um you know, collaboration is a real like is a real buzzword, right? Um, mm. And there are ways that we collaborate that really is actually parasitical. You know, mm. you know, we're using the word collaboration, but actually, what we're doing is we're just you know we have a parasite host relationship where one is taking and the other is giving. Um, oh. Right. You know, and so uh, you know, I think. Um, I think collaboration that has as its foundation more of a posture of, of hospitality and of friendship is oh really, wow yes really important for us you know mm -hmm. so you know hospitality means that like you know uh, it means that like I I'm a good host and a good guest in you know yes so, like, our organizations need to be able to you know. Um, protect their interest right yeah they need to be able to be a good host and say like mm -hmm. hey you're not, you're not you're actually not welcome in that room of the house <laughs> mm -hmm. yes you're welcome in this room of the house you know? yes and we need to be good good guests in one another's you know organization yeah. 
Yeah, which means like we're we're able to say like, okay, thank you for what you have to offer, and now it's time for me to go, and I'm going to leave. You know. And yeah. So, uh, I think hospitality is a really important paradigm for collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and the reality is is that this is very relational. Um, and uh, we, you know, it, uh, we're not going to let people into our organizations to help us with the real problems that we have that we who we do not know, like and trust. Do not, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes. You know, it's just like you know, it's in your family. It's in you know, it's yeah. like you just you know, you like the real problems that we have. You know, like we we like people have to be trustworthy to be invited yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And it takes time to build those relationships. And mm -hmm. so, like, I think, you know, this is a good example where like you and me are talking today. Yeah. We, went to, we went to seminary together. You know, yes. So I, you know, so I recognize, you know, so we know each other from there, but we actually have a mutual friend. Friend, yeah. You know, a mutual who, you know, I, you know, I, we both have a great deal of like uh, admiration for and respect for. Yes. He's the one who connected us. Yeah. So we're talking, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. so we're talking today because of you know because of him. Yes. And so, uh, we need to to be you know, we need to be good host and we need to be good guest. Okay. Um, and uh, and we need to recognize that like, um, everybody has something to contribute. To contribute. Everybody has something to receive. Hmm. It's, yeah. easy, it's easy to feel like when you're like a little organization with no money that mm -hmm. like, you know like and you see these big organizations with all this money uh, yeah to just feel like um well to, you know to feel like one is to realize like oh man the, the stuff that, the problems they have are not the problems that i have <laughs> and to recognize that like because of the resources they have um and uh and I have something to contribute. Yes. And I have something to receive, and mm -hmm. you know, and like in a way that built the whole body is built up. It's built up, yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm just thinking, um, uh, yep. because like when we come resource wise, I think the church in in Africa, probably in the global south, we might not have all the financial resources, but I think we are really growing in that. But I think resources, like because at times when when most of when Africans speak resource, people think money. Yeah. But I would say it's things like this. Yeah. That makes a difference in 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 that like a whole lot of difference. It's it's the trainings because I'm thinking if uh, the church in the global south, it's I think it's just it's just in this generation that we are finally picking up and just started start running with missions. But the church in North America has done that for decades. Mm -hmm. They have experiences. They know where they have succeeded. They know where they have failed. And so we don't want to repeat. Yes. Start from scratch and repeat that. So what resources does a church in North America has? And what experience do they have to say, hey, oh, we tried this, it failed. Don't yeah. do it this way. This are, this is, I think that is, that's the kind of real partnership we need. Yeah. And we talk about more like parasites. And I think at times missions organizations when they come in they are just like oh we are going to give you money and we are going to tell you how to do it yes. but that's not what we want right <laughs> that's not right yeah. right um yeah 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 i um all right so i let me i, I want to maybe the stories come to mind I'll, I'll share with you to kind of make this point so um so you know so we you know so we we went to um asbury seminary in justman county yeah. And if you drive around Jessup County, you always see all these uh, signs for RJ Foreman. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, in 2000, and so I, I grew, actually grew up here. My dad was a professor at the seminary for-, for Oh, uh, I didn't well. know that. Yeah. So, um, and so, um, so in 2000, 2001, something like that, RJ Foreman was diagnosed with blood cancer and mm. he was given like six months to live but he was he was the kind of guy that was like yeah six months doesn't work for me we're gonna have to get get more time out of it than that. <laughs> and he ended up living um until 2013 is when he when he oh, wow. a long time and um i remember driving past his his house um 
in the winter time and mm -hmm. uh and he had a uh, gotten one of those snow makers that they have on like ski resorts and he was blowing oh. snow in his front yard um, oh. and i realized that like you know it was important to him for a lot of reasons to have a white christmas mm. you know and i realized that like i will never have the problem of a white christmas yes because i will never have the resources to be able to do anything about to it. Do, yeah. No. And I think that it's easy to see like money, you know, as a like, you know, as um as a as a just a pure good thing mm -hmm. and and miss the way that like that is a resource that creates problems that it can mm -hmm. solve. Right. And yeah. So, like, I will never have the problem of, yeah. of a white Christmas because I will never have the resources to solve it. <laughs> and so there's a way in which our like small mission organizations of uh, by you know, when we're living by faith, uh, yeah. there's a way in which like that lack of resources also creates a lack of the problems that resources can solve. Mm, wow. Right. And we miss yeah. that. Yes. You know, and it's like, yeah. well, we don't, you know, uh, we can't afford to do like, you know, all this training and all this. You know, and so we don't have to, we don't have all those problems that come with all that. You know? Yeah. And, and so I think if there's, you know, if there's any way, we, you know, Paul, Paul talks about this, about learning to have, um, you know, have abundance and yeah. like, uh, to mm -hmm. something yeah. about the, about the real value and real merit of contentment, mm. of godliness, you know, and I think that if there's anything for us in kind of collaboration, it needs to be beginning with that prayer of like, Lord, grant me to be content with yes. what I have. Grant me, Lord, to to grow in godliness based mm -hmm. on based on where I am, and from that posture, be a cheerful giver to others. Mm. and to receive from them yeah and so, wow. instead of this kind of scarcity this mindset yeah yeah uh, mm -hmm. which is so tempting for so many of us yep yeah. mm -hmm. that's, not just, that's not that's not just a geographic thing yeah it's not <laughs> nope so yeah yeah wow thank you so uh how can missionaries grow in self-awareness and wholeness yeah yeah that's a good question um one of the um I'll, I'll give you i don't have the link right now i'll give it to you after this um but i'll put a little i'll put in there a sheet uh that i um that i put together on this kind of uh the practice of missional resilience about how yeah. we turn into our heart and understand our emotions and our needs and our values and make that the offering that we so I'll give I'll, I'll give that to you. Okay. Uh, I'll put I'll put the link for that. Um my observation is uh um whenever I I am privileged to speak with a missionary who's really distressed, um mm -hmm. one thing that's always that tends to be always the case in their life is that they, they're not doing a and this is true when I'm really distressed in my life, uh not doing a really good job of keeping the Sabbath. Mm. and they've just kind of got into this place where they're just kind of working 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 going 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 yeah. non-stop non yeah. um it's hard especially when you're a clergy because like you know like you're like sunday is not your sabbath sunday is <laughs> not my sabbath <laughs> yeah, you know so, yeah so i mean yeah and so um and so they're not and that's an interesting one i mean the it's interesting to think about the actually god gives the Sabbath um, and then gives what I think is the great missionary job description, which is take care of everything above and everything below and everything on yeah. the earth, all of it, take care of all of it. It's the great, you know, yeah. um, and it's, and it's a, they're called to work out of their rest, not to rest from their work. And mm -hmm. uh, when we, um, and it takes a lot of courage to walk away from a pile of stuff on your desk it takes a lot of courage to walk away 
this is especially for people in like medicine and other kind of helping fields where it's like yeah you, know, you know somebody's gonna die yeah you you know that like if you if you if you walk away somebody's gonna die um and uh and so the practice of keeping the sabbath is it takes a lot of courage today we have so our culture is so is so like fomo so fear of missing out you know yeah no so accomplishment or it's so more and more more it's like our inertia is just going 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 we have you know uh we can do all of our work from our phones you know it's just like it's just non-stop you know and so yeah keeping the sabbath have an intentional time to pause yeah to take a break and then how to use that time to like reflect process yes. you know mm -hmm. see what comes up kind of like comes up out of your heart you mm -hmm. know, so you can you can see what's most most important to you what's most yeah. resonant with you um and then you know finding ways to offer that to the lord mm -hmm. you know like i think that there's a way in which like this is kind of a this is a, i think the the things that are most like the deepest things in our heart are aligned with with the deepest things in God's heart and God's offering on behalf of the world. Mm. Um, so an example of this would be like, you know, like I, you know, I had somebody who did me wrong. Um, and I feel a need for like, like, you know, I, I feel this need for like retaliation mm. or justice. Right. Yeah. And there's a part of me that's like, I'm hurting and I want them to hurt because I'm hurt, you know. Uh, but that's not the deepest level. The deepest level is for restorative justice. Mm -hmm. That's really what I want. Yeah. What I really want is restorative justice. Yeah. I really want, you know, the Lord's peace to reign. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the deeper thing that's true. You know? Yes. And when I take the time to get to that, then I can offer that to them and say, Lord, would you, I mean, that's really what I want in this situation. So and will, will you in your time, in your way, bring that to fruition? So just that, uh, having a, having somebody who can help you process through your life sure. with people, mm -hmm. um, to having someone who can, you know, I don't think everyone needs counseling for everything. Um, yep. But I, you know, I do think it can be helpful to have you know, a guide or a mentor or a friend or somebody who you can kind of process through stuff with. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's just kind of, I don't know. It's like, maybe one more metaphor would be like, what, what's the, what, what's the check engine like for you when you're mm. like, okay, I know I need to like take a look under the hood. Take a look. Yeah. You know, and sometimes most of us have like some check engine lights that go off before we, we run off. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> learning to pay attention to those. So yeah, weird one. I start craving Chinese food. It's a weird one, but that's my. Oh my! Okay, that would yeah. be a good one for me. I love yeah, that. yeah. Like, what, what are some of the thoughts, the uh, you know, the compulsions, the emotions, you know, uh, yeah. those check engine lights that are like, I need to take a look under the hood. Mm -hmm. I'm distressed. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I, I think for me, most often it's like. I become a little more agitated and anxious. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing is I meet with my my coach every once every month. Yeah. So most often when I start getting them like, okay, please, I need to yep. meet soon. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It just helps me process and just get rid of some of the unnecessary yeah. stuff and wait. Yeah. It's like it's like you're a magnet being pulled through a junkyard. And yes. It's just like, you know, you just there's a point where you're like, I got to pause and turn the current off to this thing. <laughs> Let what's not part of it fall to the ground. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. continue on through. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I, I think I really like that you talked about Sabbath because uh, I'm, I'm not, this is not a general African thing, but I know I grew up in a setting where not walking was a sign of laziness. Yeah. And it's, you are more spiritual the more you do. Yes. And so it was easy to watch leaders who go from Monday to Sunday. Yes. And nonstop. And non and I, I still see it now, even from here, I still see a lot. It's almost like this sense of, 
I don't know if it's like Superman, Superwoman kind of of spirituality that I just think it's unhealthy. But at times I'm like, God, how can I help? I'm like, no, it's okay for you to pause and rest. You are still going to be a minister of the gospel. You are not less a minister of the gospel when you pause, take care of yourself, rest, sleep, take care of your family. And uh, I don't know what, what, Mm -hmm. I don't even know which question to ask. I, I I I can, I think I can speak into what you're saying there. So there's a, here's the problem like for us. Um, mm -hmm. One, and it's kind of, there's two problems. One is um, when you're being fruitful in ministry, when you're experiencing ministry as being fruitful, uh, first of all, like you're getting a huge dopamine hit. Mm. I mean, in your brain, you're getting a huge dopamine hit. You know, it is really satisfying to be yeah. like doing work that's challenging for you and is bearing fruit. Mm. It's personally very satisfying yeah okay it's also um it's also something that other people really admire and value and appreciate um and so it's really like man you you also get that kind of like affirmation confidence. yes and it's doing good you know like like i i had a week last week where i was like you know i did some work that i'm really really proud of yeah. And it felt great to do it. Yeah. I love yeah. it. Um, but that is uh that's a all that also kind of puts your body in a state of like fight or flight and where you're just mm -hmm. you're kind of your nervous system's elevated. And so you know, you you're not sleeping as well, you're not eating yes. as well. You're just kind of like, you know, and it's easy to get kind of caught there. Um so that's that all that all is very true. And then the other is true when it's like you feel like nothing's uh, when it's the opposite it's like mm -hmm. it's coming together and, it, and it's like wow this feels like a house of cards and, oh, you know, wow. and you know it's like i you know like like this i mean this thing feels like it's like dying and i have yeah. to, i have to save it and so there your body is also mm -hmm. and you have that same fight or flight and there's a sense of like it's almost becomes like survival you know and wow like, and so whether you're feasting or famine in ministry, yes. like your body is like really like sort of like has all the like adrenaline and cortisol yeah. flooding, flooding your system. And, um, and so it's very, they're, they're, whether it's going well or not, you're motivated to not stop. Mm. And you're motivated to like keep going. Yes like wow. yeah so either to like try to get to a place of safety or to like you know get that like or like keep you know keep going you know yeah um and so to actually pause is so like uh it takes so much courage and takes so much faith yeah and is so countercultural and yes is going to offend is going to offend people. And the truth is that the people who it offends, you probably don't need to be that. <laughs> you know? Um, but the question that I think we we, ha we want to ask ourselves is like, you know, are we, what, what, are we, what are we trying to set ourselves up for? Mm. Am I trying to set myself up to be here for two years? Or am I trying to set myself up to be here until I'm released? Oh, wow. Wow. That's good. And if I'm building a house that I just need to live in for two years, it doesn't need a foundation. Yes. Done, you know? Yeah. Uh, but if I'm building a house that I can live in until we, until the Lord calls us to something else. Yeah. It needs a foundation. Yes. 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 What are you trying to set yourself up for? Hmm. And, um, and that pause is hard, but it's really fruitful. Wow. It's really oh, fruitful. man, that is, wow. That's so good. That is so, so good. I, wow. <laughs> so it, it means even success in ministry or even failure could become an addiction. Yeah, addiction is a great word. It does have that same quality to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 
So the more I succeed, the more I want to, or, and then if I fail, the more I want to turn it around. So it's like, I'm just, and it means my identity is no longer in Christ. My identity is being tied to the thing he's called me to do. Because if my identity is in him, then I'm able to pause because it's his work and not my work. Then I'm able to pause and like say, hey, God, I'm going to rest. I'm going to take care of this body. And I'm going to, oh, man, thank you. This is good. Oh, wow. Then I I have to, con you know, I have to find in myself a willingness to say, Lord, I, when I, because I can't stop, I, I realize that I don't, I really I'm not believing right now that you've uh, conquered death, the, the resurrection. Mm. That, yeah. You know, that it's, that this, Paul says the same spirit that raises Jesus from the dead is alive in you. Yeah. It's just like, I confess, I don't believe that right now. Whoa. <laughs> it all depends on me. Yes. Wow. You know, and I need to confess that to you. And I need to express that confession to you in my I need to embody that confession. Yeah. In a pause. Oh man, uh, we are almost wrapping up. Yeah. But uh, what what would you I uh, must say uh, to our audience, or maybe just last last comments on how to build missional resilience, or just resilience as a as a believer, because I think which we all need it. Yeah. So I think I want to say two things. The first thing I want to say is you know. Um, I just, I think my prayer would be anything that, you know, that's been in our conversation that's for you to receive, uh, that you would receive it, you know, and anything that's not for you, you would just let the Holy Spirit blow it away. Take it yeah. away. And so, because I realized that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking broadly about stuff yeah. that's really in the heart for us. Yeah. Know? If anything in this is not for you, you just let it go. You know, anything that's for you, receive it. So, yeah. Um, so I like uh, this um, this Japanese pottery called kintsugi as a metaphor for okay. res missional resilience, mm -hmm. and um, it's a pe piece of pottery that's been um, that started out as being very useful, but then mm. it's totally broken. Ah, uh -huh. and we have those experiences in cross cultural ministry, and in life as you know as believers where we you know. We we start feeling very useful and we find ourselves very useless all of a sudden. Mm. And it's yeah. it's this golden love of God and others and ourselves that gently and delicately kind of re repairs this piece. And the cracks are not it's self discarded. And also the cracks are not like we don't try to hide them behind super glue. Mm. Know, we, we they're accented with gold. Wow, yes. And the piece is, becomes a masterpiece. You know, and it's more beautiful for having been broken. Mm. You know, and uh, the story of um, uh, the story that, that we need to be reminding ourselves of in our own missional resilience is a story of this brokenness made beautiful. Hmm. That the places it is in fact the places that we are hurt that are the places where we become most helpful um, yes and uh and the truth is is that it leads to you know and you, you'll know this with your 10-year ministry it leads to greater brokenness and yeah and then greater you know beauty you know and yeah paul says that you know we are uh you know we are masterpieces set mm. apart for the good works long ago that the Lord has for us. He says also in, you know, I think the passage in Corinthians is perfect for this about how we mm. this treasure in earth and jars. I think, yep. And yeah. I don't know, there's a version that says we are the treasure in trash. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. And why do we hold this treasure in earth and jars? Uh, to show that the transcendent power belongs to God. And missional resilience is about our own being shaped into the and being conformed to the image of Jesus. Mm. And it's beautiful for us. Uh, mm. But it also has the effect of allowing our light to shine in the world in ways that people glorify our Father who's in heaven. Not Amen. Us. Amen. 
and, and God is glorified and his people are edified and yeah and his mission in the world his kingdom is is advanced and so uh, we tend to think about our own brokenness as being a hindrance to that instead mm -hmm. of it as actually very much a part of the process that's the yeah holding that we're in so my friend danny said uh in the end it'll be okay and if it's not okay it's not the end and, whoa yeah. and you know and i know that there are times where i'm aware that it's not okay yeah, yeah. and i think when when i'm in that space it's important to remember and remind yeah. myself it's not the end yeah in the end it'll be okay if it's not okay it's not the end in the end it's going to be okay yeah. in the end every need will be met every knee will bow and yeah. every tongue will confess that jesus christ is the lord yeah mm -hmm. in the end is it okay if I copy that statement? Yeah, please take it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Bill, how about for you? Any any kind of last thoughts, comments? You oh, want to... my. Yeah. I would say the first thing is, please, you want to get this book, my people. It's there's just I think there's just so much in it that we can't talk in a conversation that we can't finish in a... It's, yeah, it is. If you're a missionary, if you know a missionary, if you serve in a missionary or a mission, if you're a church leader or just anybody, please, I think you should get this. The title is Essential for People Care. I'm going to put the link in the description below. And uh, and I would say for every, if you're a missionary, you're on the field, you're serving, and you feel tired. You feel like maybe I should give up. I want you to know that God sees you. <laughs> Uh, God sees what you're doing. He sees your labor of love. And if you mean, if it means you should step back a little and just rest and take care of your soul and, and lament uh, whatever in, you need to be able to be made to do to become whole, do it. It's okay. God understands you are not, you're not a failure for doing that. Uh, I want you to know that God, God understands that he will cause you. He's faithful. He's with you and he will not abandon you. He's watching over you. And, uh, we trust that this has blessed you in some way and so share it with someone jeff would you want to pray pray for anyone who's watching any of our viewers yeah absolutely yeah, i'd love to do that so uh, in the name of the father son and holy spirit all men amen. oh heavenly king the comfort of the spirit of truth who are everywhere present who fills all things treasury of blessings come and abide in us cleanse us from all impurity and save our souls mm -hmm. uh, lord jesus i just thank you for this um this time with vilna and uh, for the people who will who will receive it, um, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, minister to them in the way that they need to be ministered to uh, by you, that you would stretch out your hand from heaven to bless them, uh, that you yourself would uh, remove the obstacles that mm -hmm. are before them, that you would give to them your peace, uh, not the peace that the world gives, but your peace, your peace that transcends our understanding and our comprehensions. Lord, help us to become your men and women of prayer. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to join you in your mission in this world. Help us, Lord, to come alongside your beloved, um, as your beloved, and, uh, and encourage them. Lord, uh, the fields are as white on the harvest as they've ever been. And the need, mm -hmm. Lord, for laborers is great. And so, uh, but they're not our laborers, they're your laborers. And so we ask that you'd send them, we ask that you'd sustain them. We ask that you would help us to come alongside and support them. So pray all of this in your name because you are good and you truly do love us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.